chief priest, teachers of the law, elders of the people. The whole gamut of religious leadership in Israel at the time. He began to speak to them in parables. No messing he did, because he's talking to them about a vineyard. Now, he's only going to say a man planted a vineyard and things go ping in the brains of every religious person listening. Because in the Old Testament, the vineyard is a famous picture of Israel. In fact, it looks as if the details of verse 1 deliberately evoke Isaiah 5, Isaiah 5 2. Here's a song of the vineyard in Isaiah 5. My love had a vineyard on a fertile hill. He built a hedge round it, removed its stones, planted a vine. He built a tower in the middle of it and constructed a wine press. That much we've got in Jesus' parable already. But then Isaiah says he waited for it to produce edible grapes. Where's the fruit? edible grapes but it produced sour ones instead Jesus goes along to a fig tree looking for early figs which are sour and bitter and nasty I'll even settle for that there's nothing on that fig tree in chapter 11 he curses it and it's cut off from the roots not even sour figs anymore now there are lots of other examples of Israel being described in the Old Testament as being like a vineyard in its relationship to the God of the Covenant Psalm 80 Isaiah 27, Jeremiah 2 and 12, Ezekiel 19, Hosea 10. But the word in these verses echoes explicitly this song of the vineyard from Isaiah. And that song of the vineyard in Isaiah, in Isaiah, is explicitly drawn out of God's disappointment, his bitter disappointment with his people. And there it is. So, Jesus begins his parable with his description of the process, creating a vineyard, looking for a harvest, identical in so many aspects with the parable in Isaiah. But Isaiah's parable of the vineyard ends with the devastation of Jerusalem. Jesus' parable goes beyond that to the creation of a new people of God. The creation that his death and resurrection are about to purchase. A new people for God. So, what's happening? Jesus is addressing these people and he's doing it in a way that's accustomed. He's doing it in, in the parable of the vineyard, picking up the song of the vineyard over God's disappointment at no fruit in his people. And what he provides for it, that vineyard provider, what he does is he, he puts a fence around it, he digs a pit for its wine press, he builds a watchtower. Here's a sort of provision. Fences keep out four-legged predators. A wine press ensures the fruit can be processed into product. Watchtower? Hmm. Interestingly, the Jewish Targum on uh, Isaiah 5.2 interprets the tower as the temple, which, given the events and the teaching of the previous chapter, might be very telling. The temple is in the frame, in the current way of thinking. Interesting little thing here is that the... Um, <clears throat> The relationship of tenant farmer to absentee landowner, it's very much in the forefront of thinking in first century Palestine. Because what's been going on, the Romans have come in, they've taken over everything, and the poor little tenant farmers, to a large extent, have lost their own place. And it's all been placed in the hands of big people who've sucked up to Rome. So you've got more and more, you've got big farms, or big uh, estates being created at the expense of the ordinary Palestinian peasant. This is a real hot potato, isn't it? Jesus is not mucking about here, you know, in terms of society and politics. That relationship is, uh, is, a, is a touchy sort of thing. And you're the landowner. Is at the heart of this parable. There's a very strong suggestion in a number of the commentaries that this land that had all been sort of taken off the peasants and given to the rich and powerful and all the rest of it, um, the sort of people that are in the Sanhedrin, the sort of people that Jesus is talking to, they are just the sort of people who have benefited from that. They've got the land. Uh, it, just, it just makes the whole thing even more red hot to touch, doesn't it? Yeah. So anyway, this, this guy puts in the capital investment sticks some of the new landless Palestinian peasantry in there in order to get an income out of them. And then verse 2. <laughs> it gets quicker. And then verse 2. 
At harvest time he sends a slave to the tenants to collect from them his portion of the crops. I've come for me rent. <laughs> I've come for the rent. And he's standing at the door with his book. Well, no, he doesn't. He sends his servant along, as anybody would. He's done all this stuff. He's got this land. He's made this capital investment. He goes away and waits. And there's this share cropping thing going on. So, so you know, it's, it's when you get crop, then you share some of the crop with the landlord. It's going to be at least four years before there are any grapes to share in. At least four years. So the uh, tenants have uh, had long enough to settle down and settle in and get their feet under the table and view their tenancy in quite thoroughly proprietorial ways. It's theirs now. It's theirs. It is extremely easy and equally disastrous to see anything we have on trust from God as being ours, isn't it? And it happens in religion, but it doesn't happen in Christian faith. Did, did you see where I'm coming from on this one? That's one to watch, isn't it? Anyway, so this is going on, the parable's been told, and, you know, the, the, the slave has come back to the tenant to collect his portion of the crops. The hearers must recognise the reference to Isaiah. They must realise the farmer tenants are the spiritual leaders of Israel who've rejected God's prophets across the centuries. God's tenants are, are there to, to give a fruitful return to God from his vineyard, and they haven't. And the leaders of the people, the tenants in the vineyard, have just rejected God's prophets across the centuries and failed to give God the fruit they owe him. And then the man comes back looking for his rent. What's their response then, verses 3 to 8? Their response is scandalous in any ears, isn't it? Those tenants, it says there in verse 3, they seized his slave, beat him and sent him away empty-handed. Well, that's not right, is it? <laughs> so he sent another slave to them again. This one they struck on the head and treated outrageously. Whoa, 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 whoa. You can't just think like that. You know, the, the, the servant of an important man is an important man himself. He sent another, and that one they killed. This happened to many others, some of whom they uh, were beaten and others killed. The owner, by verse 6, is devoid of more servants. But he has a son. He has an only son. He has a dear son. And you know, don't you, that the parable is coming to its climax with all this build-up to the son, yeah? He had a beloved son, just the one. And it recalls the language of the voice from heaven in chapter 1, verse 11 at the baptism, doesn't it? My beloved son, whom I love. And in chapter 9, verse 7 at the, at the um, transfiguration. Again, that voice from heaven. The reader is in no doubt about who it is that the son here represents, right? And they're going to kill him. And throw his body outside the vineyard. And Jesus is standing in Jerusalem amongst the people who want to kill him and discredit him and put him in disgrace and his disciples can you imagine being a disciple of Jesus tough call isn't it they're standing there listening to him saying this to these people doesn't he know well yes he does that's the whole deal This is a parable, yeah. But Jesus is 100% casting himself as the son in the parable. And his body will be thrown out. No decent burial. Shameful way of death in their thinking. Discredited in death. An accursed death. And we know what Paul makes of that in his own theology of the cross. Cursed is anyone who's hanged on a tree. Bearing the curse of my sin. They threw his body out. But actually it's the tenants that are going to be thrown out because at the resurrection God reverses the whole picture. And resurrection faith reverses the whole picture. It's not religion at all in that sense. God is going to reverse the deal, verse 9, like this. 
What then will the owner of the vineyard do? He'll come and destroy those tenants and give the vineyard to others. Now, Jesus is taking them straight on, isn't he? You're going to lose the lot. <laughs> you know, have you had that said to you? <laughs> You'll lose the lot. Boys, you're going to lose the lot. What then will the owner of the vineyard do? It's a question. It invites the hearers to judge the case. Because it, this hostility to Jesus, it, it, it's so unreasonable. And the unreasonable of it, they need to see what's he going to do. Get it through your head, think it through, come up with the answer. The tenancy of the vineyard will pass to others. And this is where the whole thing starts to glow red hot. The Messiah was supposed to be, in the religious leaders' thinking, to bring the Gentiles to submit to them and worship in their way, at their place, in their temple, at their Jerusalem, yeah? Yeah. <clears throat> the tenants have taken over the vineyard, haven't they? But Jesus is saying something here that really sounds very different to that indeed. The others are going to inherit. The Gentiles are going to inherit. And Mark's readers would have had no difficulty at all in identifying these others who are reallocated the tenancy as the Church of God. Now, they're up in Rome, those readers. They're suffering for their faith at the heart of Rome's evil empire. You're the others that inherit. It's the idea spelled out in Romans 11, you know, of an unproductive vine being pruned off the rootstock with a new wild shoot being grafted in to the rootstock, one that will be fruitful. <laughs> 